Thanks, Matt. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Pfeiffer. I was on the last panel, and I'll be moderating this one as our guests kind of cycle in here. I am uh, founder of cloudskills.io and host of the cloudskills.fm podcast. Basically, what I do is I help people ramp up I'm working on the upskilling issue that's out there. I've been in uh, tech about 20 years, worked at Amazon Web Services for a while, worked at Microsoft for a while. About the last five years or so, I've been trying to uh, help people with training and upskilling. So that's what I do. And then I'd like to just go through our panel, get you guys' introductions. We'll start with Tom. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Tom Manville, Director of Engineering at Kasten by Veeam, where we do data management and data protection for Kubernetes. Hi, uh, my name's Robert Hodges, and I'm CEO of Altinity. We market and support ClickHouse, which is a popular open source SQL data warehouse. And hi, everybody. I'm Hakeem Weatherspoon. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Exotanium. It's a cloud optimization company. I'm also a professor at Cornell University. Um, and this came out of my lab. Great to have you guys here. Let's take a seat. I think we're waiting on one more. Hopefully, she'll come in. Um, but while we're just kind of doing that and getting started, and I think people are still cycling in. Tom, we'll start with you. Um, let's kind of take it from a perspective of a lot of people are maybe doing on-prem still. And what is data management you know, going to start to look like for them as they move towards the cloud? It's a completely huge shift for somebody that's been doing on-prem. Yeah, you know, I think if you're, you're still doing a lot of on-prem but cloud native, you're probably incorporating your existing infrastructure and, and consuming that w within Kubernetes, with other, other cloud native projects. Um, a lot of people who are moving to cloud are kind of using cloud native first projects. So if you're moving to AWS or EKS, AKS, GKS, all the KSs, right? Um, you're, you may be using more kind of cloud native first software initially. Um, and so you, you might be adopting kind of uh, more of these practices on top. I think, but you know, you, you haven't wasted your, your uh, your initial spend on your infrastructure, right? You're still able to consume that within Kubernetes and other cloud native projects. Right. Yeah, um, that's uh, for us a little bit hard to, to answer because there's such a diversity of people and, and such a diversity of ways to use infrastructure. So in our business, a sizable fraction of the people that, that we serve are startups, some of them quite small and often growing rapidly, and they just go straight to the cloud. So they have no previous uh, heritage of being in, in on-prem or even self-managed environments. They want to do everything in serverless services and then just, you know, um, everything as managed as possible. At the opposite end, we have people in financial services who are, uh, you know, sort of devoted to on-prem. They have a variety of reasons that they want to be there. They have, be it compliance, be it control over data, be it economics. And in that case, what they're doing is they're going cloud native, but they're just doing it in the on-prem environments. And then there's a spectrum of people who are moving back and forth in between. You know, they may get corporate. Uh, you know, we have one big customer where they just got a corporate director, thou shalt cloud. And so up they went. Um, they're doing it on Kubernetes, but, you know, they're, they're just, it was just a path that was chosen for them. When you say they're moving back and forth, is that hybrid cloud? Is that, you know, dynamic? Or is it kind of a stack decision they make initially? No, it's a, it's a, I, I, multi-cloud in particularly in data warehouses, it's kind of like buying property. Um, you or or maybe doing long-term leases, so you may choose where to you know where to get your infrastructure, uh, but it's a choice that you make for a long time. And then a new application comes along; it has different economics, different compliance requirements, and you'll do it somewhere else. So you'll get this this sort of um, spread of things across different environments that you then have to manage. Yeah, I would say that we're seeing a lot in um, this whole migration to the cloud. So in terms of data. Uh, it's probably the most challenging where you, uh, I'll say a company, if they had 100 applications, um, and it's a brick and mortar company or whatnot, or a retail company, then um, some percent, uh, and I'm going to make this number up, so don't quote that, but it may be 10, 15 percent may actually be in the cloud and cloud native of some sort. Um, but then you may have another 60 to 80 percent that's on-prem, and they're working to move that to the cloud. So it has to go through some sort of transformation. And that cl the data and that interoperability is the really difficult piece. That's why everybody tries to do a lift and shift to begin with. <laughs> um, the greenfield is the easy part. I sh not, that word should be banned, easy. Simple, but not easy. Yeah, exactly. But um, so they, uh, if you can write something from scratch almost and start with Kubernetes in the cloud, uh, then you're in good shape. So cloud native is, is awesome. Um, but if something's brownfield, you know, that starts uh, on-prem, 
and you're trying to make it in the cloud, then you have to somehow change your operations or change something significantly to make that fit. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the difficulty in that 15 to you know, 50 percent or more of the applications. What would you guys say would be the biggest challenge in that scenario? I mean, there's so many to pick from, right? But any common patterns, repeating issues that you see over and over and over again that are like top of mind? Or is it just so many different things that you can't even keep track of it? I think at some point, you know, you have a lot of momentum, you have a lot of applications, and you know, the next step is you're doing some type of migration. Even if, it's, even if you're redeveloping the application, there's still gonna be a big migration you have to do. And moving between different environments in that, that manner is often very challenging. You have to make sure that you don't drop support for old customers, old uh, clients, and that kind of thing. So. I have a, a pretty civil take on this, which is one we experienced ourselves. Um, normal people cannot run Kubernetes at scale. So how many people here run Kubernetes operations? Or, you know, run big, you run Kubernetes directly? Come on, raise your hands, don't be shy. Um, doesn't not managed exactly. So like say on cops or yeah yeah. See you're not normal. Um, <laughs> no no. That, but if you if you do it you're not normal. So I, I think the biggest like we are really big fans of running uh, data warehouse clusters on um, uh, on Kubernetes. We wrote the ClickHouse operator, so it was I think the first operator written for a data warehouse. Um, but the problem that people have no problem dealing with that. I mean, once Kubernetes is up and running, it's really easy to run st run databases with operators. It's getting Kubernetes up and running in the first place. And so, as a result, even in our business where we're specialists in this, we use managed Kubernetes to run our to run our cloud service. Yeah, uh, just taking that slightly different, I would say that another significant issue is state. So we're talking about data, but then there's also state and application and um, migrating your application in the cloud or just migrating your application in general when it's stateful database. So the thing that um, you said that reminded me of that is a database to begin with. How do you deal with those applications? If it's stateless, again, I don't want to use the word easy, but it's easier. But uh, the ones that are dealing with the database or any type of dependencies can be quite uh, difficult. So you need some magic wand that can help you with stateful migration. Got it. All right. So if somebody is, you know, completely new to the Kubernetes world, they're just getting started, they're familiar with VMs, you know, they've been doing traditional kind of infrastructure for years. What par parallels can we draw from traditional VMs to things that are happening in Kubernetes just to map something that we already know in you know, the VM world over to Kubernetes? I think the shift we're seeing is largely pretty similar. You know, it's uh, a lot of the same um, kind of players in the ecosystem are are working for these common goals of really running efficient and reliable infrastructure. Uh, I will say that in, in this shift, there has been a lot more focus on open source in the community, which has been awesome, right? I mean, we've already commented on the number of, of projects and, and uh, companies in the cloud native space. Uh, I think this, it's really cool to see the community, right? It's one of my favorite things about KubeCon, uh, being able to come here and meet, meet everyone in the community. Um, but otherwise, I think the, the shifts are pretty similar. You know, there's a lot of commonality between the, the VM revolution and con containerization. Yeah, I, I guess I have a little different take on this because I've run stuff on VMs for a long time and also um, racked equipment for, for decades. And VMs at some level, particularly if you went to the Amazon cloud um, or if you worked with VM, VMware, for example, which does a pretty complete job on virtualization, it, from the perspective of somebody like me who's running an application, it's the same as a host. It's just not that different. Um, it has more flexibility, perhaps, and I can, you know, sort of divide up you know, I have more choices in terms of how much, you know, scaling up infrastructure and scaling it back down again. I think the difference that you have to kind of get your head around when you're using cloud native and particularly Kubernetes is that Kubernetes is not VMs. It's really a way of building and managing distributed applications. And I think that like a lot of the application complexity that people talk about with Kubernetes, to me, I don't really see it because Kubernetes just has the pieces that are necessary to make distributed ap applications work. And so I think part of it is, you know, to go cloud native and to use it effectively is to kind of get your head around the fact you're building cloud, you're building distributed applications. And if you get that right, then a lot of stuff that Kubernetes does just falls into place as just conveniences that allow you to do these applications. And a good example is just Kubernetes secrets. 
you know, giving, giving out, inf you know, privileged information to different parts of your application. So a question from the audience. Yeah. So normal people can't run Kubernetes. You use managed services, and the managed services allow you to run distributed service distributed applications, or do build distributed architectures. So is the point then you don't you really shouldn't even bother with building it yourself because that's really the work of people who are like working who are working kind of in the plumbing at a, at a big cloud service, for example? If, if by build, if it, you mean the application? No, you should absolutely build that yourselves. And I think that the... the no, I mean, you should not build Kubernetes yourself. I mean, you should not be using, you should be using a Kubernetes as a managed service and building... That's, yeah, up to a point, that's, I think that's the simplest way to do it. And so, for example, in our business, we're running, we're running, you know, like a cloud service. We're... We're on Amazon now. We're going to to, um, uh, to GCS, and for us to have to figure out how to manage Kubernetes in both of those environments would just take a lot of time. It's simpler for us to uh, uh, to run EKS, for example, in Amazon and GKS in Google. The cost is not that high. These are actually managed Kubernetes services are a really good deal. That's the other thing about them. Like um, to run managed Kubernetes in in Amazon. What do you, it, you, you're paying like a few tens of dollars per month for the master nodes. Um, it, what you do give up is you don't get to control the versions. Uh, so like you, you hit a problem with a driver, you know, like a storage driver, which we actually hit with GP3 storage. Yeah, you have to work around that, but in general, the fact that, that it's managed for you and they deal with stuff like upgrades is such a huge, um, you know, such a huge leg up that I, at least for us, that was, that was a really good choice. So what I love about this question is it was, you know, what's the difference between containers and virtualization? And then we're talking about managed platforms. That's absolutely right. Uh, you know, from my sense, uh, the key is that for most people, there is really no difference. And actually, there's a whole academic argument that there's no difference between the two. Uh, a virtual machine is a container, and a container is a virtual machine. There's a whole bunch of papers that discuss that. But the key here is uh, orchestration is and most people, you know, it's very difficult to set up a Kubernetes cluster by themselves using KOps or whatnot. And why do it for most people? You can use uh, EKS, GKS, you know, AKS or whatnot. And that's perfectly fine for most people. Um, and just to, to cap off that part about the debate, uh, we actually, for Exotanium, we actually do what's called a nested virtualization. So we provide for a container runtime interface, uh, OCI interface was actually a virtual machine, um, and you would never know. So, I mean, that's, we make something academic, actually, into commercial. I did want to comment when you said that there was, like, six shaking heads right in the front row. Where <laughs> people violently disagree. I don't know if, um, I think there's a few raised hands. So we yeah, let's take a question. Just back to the comment about uh, VMs and uh, Kubernetes. Someone was talking to me, and I kind of thought for a second, people have dealt with vCloud Director in VMware, you know, the vApp concept and the metadata. So you could have multiple VMs in a vApp, and then there's the metadata around. I'm just from the world of backup and recovery. So, you know, we, we'd say, oh, they'll back up the whole vApp, not just the VM. And that kind of reminds me of situation with pods and deployment. So I don't know, does that make sense? And this Absolutely, yeah. And anything that, I, I'm just looking for things that you guys can map you know, from what you know already to this new world. But uh, please jump in there. Yeah, I worked on vCloud Director, um, or some of the peripheral projects when I was at VMware, and yeah, that's a very, it's a multi-tenant cloud. And in fact, there's a lot of um, similarities between the kind of resource management. It's essentially like a multi-tenant cluster manager. And, you know, if you look at what Kubernetes does, it does very, very similar things. Um, uh, so there's, yeah, there's, I, I think that was what, what that team did was kind of a bridge between the, you know, the traditional VMware architecture and Kubernetes. And now if you go look at what they're doing right now, of course they're, sh they're sliding everything over to Kubernetes. I, I just want to blur the line uh, a little bit. So someone in the earlier panel mentioned vMotion. So they said, wouldn't you like to be able to do something like vMotion? Um, well, that's exactly what we do. So we do vMotion. Um, it's not VMware vMotion, it's a virtual machine 
migration, it's a live migration, and we're moving containers, we're moving the machine. Um, for, so for Exotanium, that's how we provide the cloud optimization. We're able to do a consolidation and migrate things around, but they are containers, they are virtual machines. <laughs> no, so we have actually blurred that line. And that was actually gonna be one of my big questions because obviously the staple application uh, conversation can get kind of tricky. Obviously it's coming up. Um, how is the cloud native ecosystem supporting that? Obviously, I think you're working on it, but um, in your guys' view, like how is the ecosystem coming together to solve that problem? There's a really big effort by the community. I mean, Six Storage is a great example. Jing was up here, you know, one of the, one of the tech leads um, of, of that community. Um, and, you know, there's many, many primitives that are in Kubernetes itself baked in, right? I mean, the, you know, consuming CSI, uh, snapshotting support, um, object support is coming as well, uh, that let you consume storage from Kubernetes, even if it's, you know, legacy storage systems that uh, were not de were designed way before Kubernetes even was. Um, and so the, there's a lot of primitives itself that help you uh, build upon uh, in Kubernetes. I think what the challenge is is that you have a new model for deploying and, and building your applications that have to rethink how they consume that storage, and they have to somehow go and manage that, right? You need some data management around that as well. Yeah, I think that um, I, I can just, again, our use case is not the same as everybody else's, but I know one place where we have a kind of a challenge with Kubernetes is how to get the advantages of NVMe SSD, which is locally attached, and still get all the other cool things that pods do in Kubernetes, like, hey, you know, make the pod bigger, move it somewhere else, as you were just saying. Uh, well, you know, if your storage is living on one node and you're, you get scheduled somewhere else, you don't have data anymore. So what we actually do right now is we mostly use block storage. We're, um, you know, so, and by that I mean like Amazon uh, EBS because it does allow us to go ahead and move the pods around as long as they're within range of the, you know, you know on the same network. Um, that, so being able to see something that would allow us to get the advantages of scheduling and the flexibility of being able to move pods, uh, you know, for example, change their versions and things like that uh, without losing our storage, and uh, that, that would be really cool. And I actually, one of the conversations I already heard today is I know this, People at storage companies are working on exactly that problem, and I want to hear more. This is this sounds really cool. If Kubernetes could do that, that would be very interesting. Yeah, handling state uh, is a very challenging problem, and there's been a lot of great advancements. So there's you know ways to suspend and resume uh, Kubernetes applications, and if you can do it very fast, then it can look um, almost live. And then uh, the issue is then some of the residual state uh, network connections and whatnot. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of great work uh, in that direction. I, I will say that maybe here's one of the key differences between a container and a, a virtual machine. A container essentially is, uh, well, a process group. <laughs> you know, containers, a set of processes. And the processes have dependencies on the operating system. And so um, it's hard to retain all the state uh, that the operating system maintains uh, to the file system, to the network, to everything. A virtual machine migration is a bit easier because you're below that. You're moving the entire operating system and everything with it. And so that's why, um, you know, IBM and, and Zen and VMware have been able to do virtual machine migration for 50 years. And that's why process migration has been difficult for 50 years because of all the residual state. Um, there are mechanisms that make that a lot easier today. But it's still, you know, you're still fighting with network or storage or something, and where you kind of just skirt that issue with the virtual machine. I think the state you're talking about is more kind of the configuration of, of the container itself. And, but there's other, you know, a lot of the state that we, I think we're considering, your example, uh, many databases are run inside Kubernetes, and that is, that's probably a little bit different uh, migration use case, right? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, so we actually migrate a database. Um, and it's not a problem, so if you have a scratch disk, you might migrate that. If you're using a network disk, so EBS or EFS or, um, you know, anything through the network, that's easy. Uh, it's just a matter of time in some sense, but you can migrate the entire, I mean, that's the, the, the nice thing about a virtual machine is you can migrate the entire thing. Um, database and every, all the, if you had uh, many different network connections, you can actually migrate and maintain that. So I guess the key is that 
Uh, I'm just saying that because that's something that we do today and it works today. But if you do it at the, the process level, it's actually difficult and we made progress and a lot of it works, but not necessarily all of it. Yeah, I think to, to add on to this migration question, I think what's happening in a lot of modern databases, and Snowflake is an example of this, is they're starting to use object storage as their backing yeah. store. And um, so then when you spin up the data warehouse, if you will, that's just compute and some amount of materialized data that's sucked in off the object storage and then you know, placed onto high-speed storage or even in memory. Um, so there's no, the, the volumes of data that, that large data services deal with are so large that we no longer think about moving them. Um, and we think more in terms of put them right to, from the beginning, put them in a cheap place that you can access quickly um, from, a wide, from, a, you know, from a wide range of locations on the network and then you build the processing on top of that. So I think this migration problem for these large systems, we don't even do backup anymore. It's just too, the, the, the data volumes are too large. We, we, you know, rather than having backups, we would try and get it replicated to two sites. Um, you know, and if one goes down, we, great, we run on the other one. So it's, I, th I think this, some of the things that, that, that VMware did and, and, and did very well, I think are now changing with some of these services. Granted, there's a bunch of applications that still need to move around, and that's an incredibly powerful capability. You mentioned you were using uh, EBS, right? Um, so e EBS has, it takes, when you take a snapshot of EBS, it uses incremental snapshotting. Is that, is that sufficient for you or is that? <coughs> uh, actually, we don't even use that, and, but that's more um, our own fault. Um, it, the, the problem with the snapshots is that they're difficult to manage. And so for example, one of the things that we have to do to get adequate performance is we often use multiple EBS volumes. I mean, these are, this is like bad in theory. But in practice, uh, for a given VM size, the way the easiest way to increase your storage bandwidth on um, EBS is just to have more volumes. A single volume will only get so much bandwidth. So it, snapshots then become very difficult to manage because you've got to take them all at the same time. So again, with, you know, with these large databases, Cassandra is an example of this, um, the, you know, the Hadoop file system, the replication capabilities, things that previously used to be in storage have moved up into the application, and the applications take care of them at a completely different level. We, we do it the same way. All right, get your questions ready. I'm going to do some Q&A with you guys towards the end. I got a couple more questions before that, but get your questions ready. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about security. Um, how do I defend against ransomware in this cloud-native world? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing definitely a lot of ransomware attacks come up. It's both, it's really top of mind. There's been some very high-profile ones. Um, some even lower, lower profile ones that we, you know, people don't uh, publicize as much. Uh, it's definitely a hard problem. I think there's kind of, you have to define your attack service area um, and you want to treat it as broad as possible. So typically you want to figure out uh, if, if an attacker can own some part of your infrastructure, what can they go get? Uh, and then you want to make sure that you're able to do some kind of recovery given that they had, they've owned this infrastructure. Um, you know, the, the approach that we, we view is that you really need to take immutable backups of your infrastructure, of your, of your data, that uh, you, no one can delete, you know, so the, it's impossible essentially to delete it ever, you know, you have to, you'll pay for it until the, the expiry time essentially. Um, but it's definitely, uh, it's top of mind for a lot of people right now, certainly. Yeah. yeah, this is just like one bad thing in security, which is just like a whole bag full of bad things. So I, I, I mean, we worry about ransomware, but we also worry about just attackers getting in and getting at data that, for example, is supposed to be GDPR protected. So I think one thing is reducing attack surface. As you just mentioned, that's like a really big deal. Just things that, if you got something you want to protect, just make it non-routable. That's our first, that's the first thing I try to do. But the second thing is, and that, I think this is where Kubernetes and containers are really good, just make as much stuff in your system immutable as possible. If somebody gets in and messes with Docker, you know, or whatever container system you're using, just respin the container. Um, there's just not that much they can change. A virus can't go very far inside a Docker container. Um, so I think that's also really helpful, and that's where, you know, one of the places where Kubernetes definitely helps. It brings up other issues in the, you know, it's complex, the, the networking. I've, I find in, in Kubernetes particularly, the biggest security we have is just protecting the clusters, not inside. It's just like, hey, the cluster is the service. You got to protect the, cl the the cluster now. So that's a that's a pretty big job. 
Yeah, I don't have much to, to add, but it's, it's funny that this may be a good answer where blockchain may actually work, which is a, a versioned immutable store in some sense. Um, and if you have that, uh, there's actually another uh, argument, which is that, you know, should you ever really delete? GDPR requires you to be able to, but in reality, we have so much data that, um, and it, it becomes cheap over time. I know the managed bit is still expensive. That it's hard to delete, uh, and if it's immutable, that's actually one of the things that help against ransomware. But I agree that's ransomware is one issue in, in many. All right, question for the audience. How many people in here have left something running in their AWS or Azure or GCP account and came back a couple days later and spent way more money than you wanted to? <laughs> like almost the whole crowd. Okay. How do we navigate cost savings in cloud native? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think you really have to understand what's going on. Cloud Native is, <laughs> uh, at its core, Cloud Native is an abstraction, right? It provides you abstraction over some type of infrastructure. And uh, obviously, if, you're, if you don't know what's going on under the covers through either some kind of monitoring or, or something else, uh, the cost can add up very quickly. Um, you know, it's uh, one, one small action can have cascading effects under these different layers of abstraction. Um, and you can look at that across different types of projects, you know, especially in uh, even you know, if you're taking too many snapshots, you're not reclaiming them, um, that, that can be a pretty big problem, definitely. Um, how many people here use Grafana? Okay, great, yeah. We love Grafana, so anything that we, we just try and visualize everything that we manage. And I, I said that, you know, we don't run Kubernetes, but by golly, we wanna understand exactly what it's doing. So we try to, we try to have, and I think um, Cloud Native does, you know, like VMs are fairly easy to keep track of, they're discrete resources. You, you, you know, you can go get the accounting data from Amazon or GCS or whatever. Um, cloud native is harder because you may not, there's maybe not a direct mapping between like the resources being consumed by a pod and the underlying infrastructure that's running on. So making that, you know, understanding that accounting and allocating costs can be difficult to understand your spend. So we just try and visualize everything and <clears throat> we watch it. We have alerts. Um, it's a, it's not a, there's no easy problem and I, uh, there's no easy answer and I, to be honest, I don't think Amazon is motivated to make it easy. So it's products like yours that are. Yeah, no, this is a what you really have. hard problem. So, I mean, even us, we've, you know, had something, a uh, zombie process, you know, that's running forever and consuming uh, thousands of dollars or whatnot. So it's a hard problem, uh, monitoring, visualization, being vigilant and, and audits and whatnot. The other thing that we do is um, we try and run in the cheapest resource possible, so like the spot market or whatnot. So, uh, and you can do that, you know, if you could do like migration and stuff like we talked about. So we can play, what we do is we play a game of whack-a-mole where we run in the cheapest location possible and we move it before we get whacked. And so we're actually able to run, actually for many months, um, uh, processes moving them back and forth cheaply. Now that doesn't get rid of the problem. That just kind of <laughs> elongates it a little bit. So you still need to be vigilant about it, but uh, we're able to reduce the cost quite a bit. All right. All right. Last question for me, and then we'll do some audience Q&A. Um, let's talk about skill building. Obviously, everybody's learning continuously every single day. Um, what does that look like? And also, one of the things I'm curious about, like, you know, there's managed Kubernetes, but then there's some point where you might want to go even deeper and if I'm a practitioner out there, what do I need to think about? Like, you know, if I'm just starting, maybe, you know, getting familiar with the platforms is the right thing first. Do I need to go super deep and become a certified Kubernetes administrator and be able to build and support clusters? What are your guys' thoughts on how deep do I need to go in my upskilling journey? Yeah, I mean, I think studying for CK is, is super valuable. You know, it's definitely a really uh, useful skill, but it's, it's not for everyone. I think people have different goals with what they want to do in the space, with what they want to work on. You know, there's other certifications, CKAD as well. Um, you know, we actually just launched a free learning platform people can check out. Um, it's, uh, we're definitely expanding it right now. Um, but we love feedback, people can play with it, let us know what they think. You get badges um, and certifications as well. Um, but I think the, what is it called? It's learning.casten.io. Is that right, Tom? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'd ask it for myself. They didn't pay yeah. me to say that, so, or ask that. <laughs> yeah, we swear. <laughs> um, but I think the cool thing about this space is that the community is really helpful and there's a lot of resources available, everything's out in the open, uh, and there's really friendly people to help that you can, you can always find on Slack or Discord or anything like that. So. 
Yeah, I think it's if the question is really like how do you how do you learn and like I people there's so many different learning patterns as you said. Um, you know, for some people it's get certification. Uh, for other people, it's just hack on it for a while till you kind of get it. Uh, I I think <clears throat> I think that Kubernetes is like a, or cloud native in general is like a lot of things. You just have to have people. You have to be obsessively curious, and you have to have people on your team who are obsessively curious. And I think a good example of that is anything related to networking um, in cloud native. Uh, overlay networks are horrendously complex um, when you actually start to look at at how they're managed, you know, what some of the trade-offs are between them, like are you bringing in Istio, for example, um, uh, service meshes. And then, of course, you know, outside the perimeter of your clusters, what's going on there? Uh, you look at, like in Kubernetes, I think one of the sort of great mysteries in Kubernetes is uh, services. Like what actually happens when you define a service? Well, it's different in every implementation. And so y this is just stuff where you have to obsess about it and try and learn as much as you can. And as you guys say, the, the communities are really, really, really helpful here. This is something I love about open source. People, you're either talking to the people who, who wrote the code, or you're talking to the people who read the code and they know how it works and they're willing to share. Yeah, skill building is, is critical. So I'll, I'll answer with a couple different perspectives. One of them is from uh, education. It's, you know, it's actually a, a wonderful time if you are increasing your skill, because there's a lot of content and people and community online. So that's really helpful. If you're hiring, so like you know, myself and a lot of us, um, we're just you know running like hell <laughs> to to try and survive. And so there, you need to hire people, you know, that can come into a role. And it's almost kind of like uh, uh, what you had said, Mike, which is I guess the mantra in it, in uh, in health, which is to you know to learn, watch, teach, do, or whatever the the, the thing is. And uh, so we're having to to do that, but we don't have that much. Slack, I guess, for a startup, uh, where we need somebody to come in and really be able to hit the ground running, you know, within a short amount of time. And there's a lot of, I mean, this is a complicated distributed system. And for us, we're actually in the guts of the operating system and the, uh, you know, hypervisor and the container itself. And so it's really uh, complicated. And, um, you know, making sure people have the time, you know, to, to go through the material. They have a community internally and externally that they can leverage. Um, and then some space uh, to make mistake. You know, heaven forbid whoever the person was at, at Facebook that <laughs> overwrote the routing table. Uh, I'm sorry. But in any case, you know, some space, you know, to, to make mistakes. So it's, it's a process, and it's, it's a critical one, though. Yeah, those are great responses. It brought up a couple of questions. I'll just follow up real quick, and then we'll do some audience Q&A. So I'm curious. One thing, right? Like, let's imagine we got a company out there that they're way behind on tech, and they see all you guys out here doing Kubernetes and all this stuff, and they're like, geez, we know we're supposed to be doing that at some point, but we just don't, we can't get there yet. How do you, um, like, for, the, for those folks, like, how do they not only hire, but train? And because it's the way we've been doing, obviously, is it going to work? What are you guys' thoughts around that? Yeah, I, th I think it's just an investment you have to make. And I, I liked a previous panel's answer where they said that. Uh, you know, maybe you hire one or two experts, but you really try to grow from within. This space is so new and so fast moving that you really have to encourage your teams to grow and, and learn uh, from within. Otherwise, you know, you can't keep up. If you, right. yeah. I mean, to the quick point earlier, it's like you can't find anybody in the job market, right? That's like exactly what you want. So you have to find a way, right, to, to get them there. Yeah, I think the key is you, uh, there, are out, there are outsourcing companies, but it's really hard to outsource everything. You need that internal knowledge and expertise. So how do you build that? There are companies, um, I'm, I, don't, I can't name any right now, that uh, can come and do some training. Um, and there are some that you, know, you can outsource. But really, you need to be able to hold, you know, hire the folks here. I'm also, um, you know, we're, so on the education side, we're actually under pressure to graduate a whole lot more you know, computer scientists. But it's already, if you go to a lot of these universities, it's like half the school is already taking at least one class. <laughs> And then a quarter of the school is already majoring in computer science. So we're about at capacity almost. Um, so we have to do some more training outside of that. Uh, yeah, I, am, I, I don't mean to be a heretic in here, but, <laughs> I, you know, because <clears throat> I already said you shouldn't run Kubernetes uh, <laughs> normally, but not everything needs to be cloud native. 
And so that's, I've actually had this conversation with customers where they said, hey, you guys have this, this uh, you know, Kubernetes is cool, we want, we want to learn it. But then I start looking at how they're going about it, and my question is, you know, you guys might be making your lives more complex than you need. You're running a, a system you don't want to lose data. Because, like, I'll give you an example. In cloud-native systems, it's very easy to spin up applications. It is equally easy to unspin them and have PVs disappear. And, uh, or, you know, like a classic Kubernetes mistake is you think you've allocated persistent volumes and you're actually running on the, nat the, you know, the local FS because you have the wrong storage class. These are mistakes that unless you're willing to, to learn, you know, to get the education so that you can avoid them and also take the care, maybe you're just better off running on VMs. You know, and it, it, you know, it's something to think about and I actually have those conversations with people sometimes. Do you think it depends on the complexity and the sophistication of the infrastructure? I mean, if you're, uh, you know, if you, would you make a recommendation to someone who's running very complex infrastructure and having operational issues? Um, no, actually, I don't think it's the complexity is, okay, I can just tell you our, our reason, like, why did we choose Kubernetes? It's portability. K Kubernetes really has a great portability story. Um, I run, I do most of my development on Minikube in my closet, but I can run the stuff on Amazon, you know, with like usually just a couple of tweaks, like change a couple properties. It's great for that. We want to be multi-cloud. It's a really fundamental part of our business is important to our customers. Kubernetes is absolutely the right choice. But if I actually had a really complex distributed application and let's say that it didn't scale up or down a lot, well, hey, you know, VMs actually might be the right, you know, um, VMs or even racked hosts where I can see what the network is doing and control it directly, that might be a better answer. Um, so it really depends on what you're doing. It's, it, and it's not, at least for me, it's not inherently the complexity. It's, it's, the, it's the flexibility. That's what VMs yeah. so, so I was just going to jump in on a, a couple things. One is I, th I think VMs are still cloud native um, if you're in a public cloud or whatnot. But number two, uh, I agree and I disagree with you. So I agree with you that Kubernetes is awesome in terms of multi-cloud and just kind of abstracting away uh, the different complexities and giving a uniform way of really handling a distributed system. Um, but I think that from our experience, you should still deal with containers as opposed to virtual machines. The advantage of a container abstraction is you um, package all the dependencies together. Uh, in that sense, a virtual machine is kind of a mess. <laughs> uh, and you know, you're much better off with a container image and some way of managing and orchestrating the, the containers. The VM, like I said, we blur the line between the two, but that's where we say containers are better for packaging, managing dependencies. Virtual machines are better for migration. Um, we're able to do a better cost optimization. Uh, you know, Kubernetes is better for a uniform interface and orchestration across different multi-clouds. So we're actually able to say that, you know, there's actually, you can pick and choose and things, certain things are better than, than others. Yeah, I, I totally support that point of view on containers. They're great for packaging. They're, they're like, it's, it's like night and day difference between when they arrived and what we had before. It's a good conversation. Thank you. All right, so I promise we do some Q&A. Who has a question? Oh, let's get Alex. He's been, I think uh, Alex had his hand up first, then we'll go around. Just making you run around. I just wanted to make you run for that joke you made about me earlier. That's <laughs> now I'm paying for it. So, Hakeem, I was curious about what you're saying about, you know, what is a container and what is a hypervisor and where does the line stop? And so, there is such, is there such thing as a hypervisor container then? <laughs> and is that kind of what you're building out? Because this all comes down to like, you know, the segmentation, doesn't it? And, you know, when in, in, in traditional VMs, you're segmenting the hardware so you can run multiple operating systems, correct? And in, uh, in a container, you can run multiple OSs because you're dependent on the OS and not the hardware. So where's the I intersection here? Yeah, so great question. And um, I said it that we blurred the lines here, so going into the technology bit, we did write a paper on this. My research group is called X Containers. And actually, Exotanium is based off of that, where we said that 
you know, containers, you're doing it all wrong. You know, the process boundaries are not good for uh, isolation. They're good for concurrency. The, uh, and then if you, so that's number one. Um, don't use process boundaries for running two different applications that don't trust each other. <laughs> number two is if you um, uh, only have one application, a container, then you don't actually need the boundary between the OS and the application, so get rid of it. Number three, dividing up hardware like you said, uh, you do need something that divides up hardware and provides isolation between essentially diverse machines, that's the hypervisor. So that's, that's essentially what this academic paper did called X Containers. It just said that we can package the OS with the application. We could put a different application in different um, containers and they all have their own OS. And we can have a uh, hypervisor that then provides the isolation. There's a 20-year-old paper called Exokernels uh, that had done that. You guys may have heard of unikernels today. Yeah. Um, but this is it's not, it's, they're related, but they're different. Um, and so uh, we have something that's based more along the philosophy of exokernels. And we're able to do exactly that, um, which is to provide a container interface, consume uh, container images, and control it the same way you would with the Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or anything, Every, identical. But we actually uh, are able to package things in a way like I just described. So what happens to the state in that case then? Um, does, it remain, the, does the container remain ephemeral? Yes, uh, yeah, so it's, it's exactly the same, but um, that's one of the ways that we're able to provide the, the trick that I was talking about, like migration, because we move the OS with the application. We move all the residual state, and we're able to maintain network connections and the network stack. So the, um, yeah, so you end up having uh, more memory consumed uh, for this way than if you only had processes. So it, uh, th there are trade-offs. Yeah. And so that's, that's one of them. But you have more flexibility and more control, and there's a lot of whole, whole other benefits. So would you just use a straight container with a microservices environment, or would you use one of these blended container hypervisor environments with a microservices environment? Because uh, the value yeah, of the I mean, microservice, what does I mean, it matter? Yeah, so you could do, the answer is you could do both. You could actually use this to create a microservice environment, because you have isolation between the microservices, and then, um, you could use it for the microservices, you know, themselves. Uh, VMware went deep on this approach as well. There was a project called Vic. Um, VMware, VMware, like, yes, there we go. <coughs> Thank you very much. So, and and for very similar reasons, and and I think the experiences were, were quite similar. The, the last the last thing I'll say is that there was a question before about bare metal, versus virtualization. So this kind of skirts that issue because you have nested virtualization. So I don't need, to, I can do exactly what I just said, and I'm not Amazon, Google, or Microsoft. So I have a VMware cluster, and you know I don't own the underlying machine. Awesome stuff. Sir, please. Yeah, I've got two things. One uh, about the education going back, because that was really interesting. Uh, my personal experience was that Kubernetes is addictive. So <laughs> I, I, I started to do something, and I thought, oh, I'll just do Kubernetes, and I totally waffled it. And uh, I ended up building a Docker swarm cluster. And then I got angry and went back. So why is it so complicated? And then it just, I just never stopped. Um, so that, I think, is one thing to get people. Like, if you let set that flame under people, they'll just you know, end up doing it all day long, uh, especially if you can do it on your laptop. Um, the other the question I've got is interesting, because you guys all have a lot of experience, is how reminiscent are all these discussions right now to the physical server to VM time, which was, I guess, what, two th I, I don't even know what year it was. It kind of happened. Um, but I missed that. And I'm interested if, if all these things went, well, no, it's not going to happen. Everyone's going to go to, no, you have to have mixed. And here we are in 2021, and we still have physical servers, right? But not as much. How much yeah. do you think that's so, uh So may I'll, I'll chime in, and uh, everybody else can chime in. So a couple of things. Um, VMware came out of Stanford, so it was a paper called Disco in 1997 reminiscent of the virtual machines from the 70s, so it was a disco ball. Uh, IBM had virtual machines, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so 
you had these physical machines, and, and actually what they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to explore different operating systems on uh, the same underlying hardware or to explore different hardware. And so, um, you know, there you actually own the machines and you were wanting to have different abstractions, uh, I mean different operating systems and whatnot. So the motivation was slightly different, whereas here, you know, in some sense we've kind of all ceded <laughs> the physical ownership of machines to a few companies. And now we want to be able to use them uh, efficiently. So I, th I think that things have changed over the 20 or so years since VMware came about. If I want to use my own physical machines efficiently, then VMware is how I should do that. But if I want to use the cloud efficiently, where um, you know it's not a capital cost, it's an operational cost, then I need a different set of techniques. So that's why I don't, I don't think it's quite the same thing as 20 years ago. Yeah, and, and VMware also, the Disco paper, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, VMware arose at a time when operating, the hardware had outstripped the capabilities of operating systems. And so the problem that people had was they could buy these, you know, you know big, you know, multi-core, pro or not multi, but multi-CPU processors that the operating systems couldn't use. And so VMware came in and said, hey, you know, we'll give you a way to carve, the, carve that machine up and you can do server consolidation. And so in some cases, people saved 80, 90% of their server costs. I think this is, there is a similar thing going on in the cloud, but I think it's more, I think what's going on with cloud native right now is flexibility. Flexibility, and, and, and to go back to the point you made about, about containers, flexibility means that one team can be programming in Go, another team can be mi programming in Python. They can build microservices. They can deploy them safely you know, without wrecking each other's dependencies. I mean, just take Python, for example, just getting two different versions of Python to deploy on a, sim on a single physical host is a nightmare. Um, you know, Kubernetes with containers makes that very easy to do. Mr. Hockey, I have a query on the whole process isolation not being sufficient. So what is your opinion about Firecracker, Gvisor, mm -hmm. and Clear containers, Kata containers? They've oh. been quite long, but yeah, none of them I mean, took off. Yeah. So just a great question. So I mean, clear containers is a virtual machine approach, really. So clear containers is closer to what I was uh, saying. Yeah. Um, but but a lot of these, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies, and if you're dealing with the government uh, at all or any probably during high performance computing, they don't actually allow you to use uh, a lot of containers because there's a, a root issue. So I can actually, you know, compromise your application with some type of root. Uh, attack, root escalation attack. Uh, so that's very hard to get correct, and so you end up having a large attack surface, the entire operating system attack surface. So the number of common vulnerabilities and exception is quite large. The number of interfaces is quite large at that process OS boundary. And so that, so, um, and the number of lines of code at, at the uh, OS versus like a hypervisor is, you know, automatic too large as well. So there's actually several reasons why it's not correct. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe that's a bit strong. It's not uh, optimal uh, to do. Now, performance-wise, is actually the best because you, you, uh, you don't have that heavyweight virtual machine underneath. And there are certain things that you do with the virtual machine that um, are expensive. So creating a new process and the shadow paging and all this other stuff can be expensive. But the, the key here is that there's a large number of classes of applications uh, in industries that aren't able to use uh, containers. Instead they use singularity instead of you know Docker exactly. Did that, did that answer your question? I think in Firecracker that's the same. They allow you to well, open up yeah, yeah. So, so I guess, I guess the key is, so the key is that you wouldn't really run even with Firecracker. You really won't run two distrusting applications within the same OS for the most part. You would put them in diff different virtual machines. Could you use the microphone? Nobody remote can hear you. <laughs> so, I think from the virtualization layer, you had that Intel VT that brought that hardware level isolation. A similar concept has to come in the container way. Yeah, so you're, um, I mean, that's actually one aspect is that you're able to have some uh, hardware level isolation 
uh, that's enforced. Uh, but it was some of the other things I mentioned as well, which is um, you just, you know, for a lot of applications, you would not have two untrusting applications share the same underlying OS. So you would end up putting them a lot of times in different, uh, in different virtual machines to begin with. Good answer. Let's move on to the last question. We got time for one more. Who's it going to be? Who wants it? Somebody's got to want it. Who wants to ask a question real quick? Alex. <laughs> so am I wrong? Does, doesn't Firecracker run underneath? Isn't it the base which the containers run upon? Isn't that the idea? So why would you need to blend then the container and the hypervisor together if the, if the, if the, if that mini VM, that micro VM is really kind of the, you know. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it depends on if you're running on bare metal uh, or not, or um, so it kind of depends on the configuration of the, of the machine itself. Um, so one of the things I mentioned is that we're able to do a, a nested virtualization. So in that sense, compared to Firecracker on bare metal, it's actually more efficient and more portable, um, but so it, it matters on how much of the entire machine you're willing to consume. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we'll take one more because we still got a couple more minutes. Something unrelated, new topic, anybody want to ask one? All right. Seemed like I touched a nerve. It was too good, that's why. <laughs> it was so good that you don't have any questions. You got to um, end on a high right. note. All right, everybody, thanks so much for being here for uh, this panel. We appreciate it. We hope you got some out of it. And we're going to take a break here, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Thank everyone. You.